Муму by Иван Тургенев In one of the outlying streets of Moscow, in a grey house with white columns and a balcony wrapped all askew, there was once living a lady, a widow surrounded by a numerous household of serfs. Her sons were in the government service at Petersburg. Her daughters were married. She went out very little and in solitude lived through the last years of her miserly and dreary old age. Her day, a joyless and gloomy day, had long been over, but the evening of her life was blacker than night. Of all her servants, the most remarkable personage was the porter, Gerasim, a man full twelve inches over the normal height, of heroic build, and deaf and dumb from his birth. The lady, his owner, had brought him up from the village where he lived alone in a little hut, apart from his brothers, and was reckoned about the most punctual of her peasants in the payment of seignorial dues. Endowed with extraordinary strength, he did the work of four men. Work flew apace under his hands, and it was a pleasant sight to see him when he was plowing, while with his huge palms pressing hard upon the plow, he seemed alone, unaided by his poor horse, to cleave the yielding bosom, bosom of the earth, or when about St. Peter's Day he plied his scythe with a furious energy that might have mown a young birch copse up by the roots, or swiftly, untiringly wielded a flail over two yards long, while the hard oblong muscles of his shoulders rose and fell like a lever. His perpetual silence lent a solemn dignity to his un unwearying labor. He was a splendid peasant, and except for his affliction, any girl would have been glad to marry him. But now they had taken Gerasim to Moscow, bought him boots, had him made a full-skirted coat for summer, a sheepskin for winter, put in to his hand a broom and a spade, and appointed, and appointed him porter. At first, he intensely disliked his new mode of life. From his childhood, he had been used to field labor, to village life. Shut off by his affliction from the society of men, he had grown up dumb and mighty, as a tree grows on a fruitful soil. When he was transported to the town, he could not understand what was being done with him. He was miserable and stupefied, and with the stupefaction of some strong young bull taken straight from the meadow where the rich grass stood up to his belly taken and put in the truck of a railway train and there while smoke and sparks and gusts of steam puff out upon the sturdy beast he is whirled onwards whirled along with loud roar and whistle whither god knows what Gerasim had to do in his new duties seemed a mere trifle to him after his hard toil as a peasant. In half an hour all his work was done, and he would once more stand stock still in the middle of the courtyard, staring open-mouthed at all the passer-by, as though trying to rest from the explanation of his perplexing position, or he would suddenly go off into some corner, a flinging and flinging a long way off the broom of the spade, or the spade, throw himself on his face on the ground and lie for hours together without stirring, like a caged beast. What Gerasim had to do in his new duties seemed a mere trifle to him after his hard toil as a peasant. In half an hour all his work was done, and he would once more stand stock still in the middle of the courtyard, staring open-mouthed at all the passer-by as though trying to wrest from them the explanation of his per perplexing position, or he would suddenly go off into some corner and, flinging a long way off the broom or the spade, throw himself on his face on the ground, and lie for hours together without stirring, like a caged beast. But man gets used to anything, and Gerasim got used to at last to living in town. He had little work to do. His whole duty consisted in keeping the courtyard clean, bringing in a barrel of water twice a day, splitting and dragging in wood for the kitchen and the house, keeping out strangers and watching at night. It must be said, he did his duty zealously. In his courtyard there was never a shaving lying around, never a speck of dust. 
if sometimes in the muddy season the wretched nag put under his charge for fetching water got stuck in the road he would simply give it a shove with his shoulder and set not only the cart but the horse itself moving if he set to chopping wood the axe fairly rang like glass and chips and chunks flew in all directions and as for strangers after he had one night caught two thieves and knocked their heads together knocked them so that there was not the slightest need to take them to the police station afterwards every one in the neighborhood began to feel a great respect for him even those who came in the daytime by no means robbers but simply unknown peasants at the sight of the terrible porter waved and shouted to him as though he could hear their shouts with all the rest of the servants gerasim was on terms hardly friendly they were afraid of him but familiar he regarded them as his fellows they explained themselves to him by signs and he understood them and exactly carried out all orders but knew his own rights too and soon no one dared to take his seat at the table gerasim was altogether of a strict and serious temper he liked order in everything even the cocks did not dare to fight in his presence or woe betide them directly he caught sight of them he would seize them by the legs swing them ten times around the ear like a wheel and throw them in different directions there were geese too kept in the yard but the goose as is well known is a dignified and reasonable bird gerasim felt a respect for them looked after them and fed them he was himself not unlike a gander of the steeps he was assigned a little garret over the kitchen he arranged it himself to his own liking made a bedstead in it of oak boards on four stumps of wood for legs a truly titanic bedstead one might have put a ton or two on it it would have not bent under the load under the bed was a solid chest in a corner stood a little table of the same strong kind and near the table a three-legged stool so solid and squat that gerasim himself would sometimes pick it up and drop it again with a smile of delight the garret was locked up by means of a padlock that looked like a calich or basket shaped loaf only black the key of of this padlock gerasim always carried about him in his girdle he did not like people to come to his garret so passed a year at the end of which a little incident befell Gerasim. The old lady, in whose service he lived as a porter, had heard in everything to the ancient ways and kept a large number of servants. In her house were not only laundresses, seamstresses, carpenters, tailors, and tailoresses, there was even a harness maker. He was reckoned as a veterinary surgeon too and a doctor for the servants there was a household doctor for the mistress there was lastly a shoemaker by the name kapiton klimov a sad drunkard klimov recorded himself as an injured creature whose merits were unappreciated a cultivated man from petersburg who ought not to be living in moscow without occupation in the wilds so to speak and if he drank as he himself expressed it empath emphatically with a blow on his chest it was sorrow drove him to do it so one day his mistress had a conversation about him with her head steward gavrila a man whom judging so solely from his little yellow eyes and nose like a duck's beak fate itself it seemed had marked out as a person in authority the lady expressed her regret at the corruption of the morals of capiton who had only the evening before been picked up somewhere in the street now gavrila she observed all of a sudden now if we were to marry him who do you think perhaps he would be steadier why not marry him indeed hmm? he could be married hmm? answered gavrila and it would be a very good thing to be sure hmm? yes 
Only who is to marry him? I, hmm, but it's at your pleasure, hmm. He may anyway, so to say, be wanted for something. He can't be turned adrift altogether. I fancy he likes Tatiana. Gavrila was on point of making some reply, but he shut his lips tightly. Yes, let him marry Tatiana, the lady decided, taking a pitch of snuff complacently. Do you hear? Yes, mm, Gavrila artic articulated, and he withdrew. Returning to his own room, it was a little lodge and was almost filled up with metal-bound trunks. Gavrila first sent his wife away and then sat down at the window and pondered. His mistress's unexpected arrangement had clearly put him in a difficulty. At last he got up and sent to call Capiton. Capiton made his appearance, but before reporting their conversation to the reader, we consider it not out of place to relate in a few words who was the Tatiana, whom it was to be Capiton's lot to marry, and why the, the great lady's order had disturbed the steward. Tatiana, one of the laundresses, referred to above as a trained and skillful laundress she was in charge of the fine linen only was a woman of twenty-eight thin fair-haired with moles on her left cheek moles on the left cheek are regarded as of evil omen in russia a token of unhappy life tatiana could not boast of her good luck from her earliest youth, she had been badly treated. She had done the work of two and had never known affection. She had been poorly clothed and had received the smallest wages. Relations she had practically none. An uncle she had once had, a butler left behind in the country as useless, and other uncles of hers were peasants. That was all. At one time she had passed for a beauty, but her good looks were very soon over in disposition she was very meek or rather scared toward herself she felt perfect indifference of others she stood in moral dread she thought of nothing but how to get her work done in good time never talked to anyone and trembled at the very name of her mistress though the latter scarcely knew her by sight when gerasim was brought from the country she was ready to die with fear on seeing his huge figure tried all she could to avoid meeting him even dropped her eyelids when sometimes she chanced to run past him hurrying from the house to the laundry gerasim at first paid no special attention to her then he used to smile when she came his way then he began even to stare admiringly at her and at last he never took his eyes off her she took his fancy, whether by the mild expression of her face or the timid timidity of her movements, who can tell? So one day she was stealing across the yard with a starched dressing jacket of her mistress's carefully poised on her outspread fingers. Someone suddenly grasped her vigorously by the elbow. She turned around and fairly screamed. Behind her stood Gerasim. With a foolish smile, making inarticulate, caressing grunts, he held out to her a gingerbread cock with gold tinsel on his tail and wings. She was about to refuse it, but he thrust it forcibly into her hand, shook his head, walked away, turning around, once more grunted something very affectionately to her. From that day forward, he gave her no peace. Wherever she went, she was on the spot at once, coming to meet her, smiling. When it, wherever she went, he was on the spot at once, coming to meet her, smiling, grunting, waving his hands. All at once, he would pull a ribbon out of his bosom of his smock and put it in her hand, or would sweep the dust out of her way. The poor girl simply did not know how to behave or what to do. Soon the whole household knew that the dumb porter's wiles, cheers, jokes, sly hints were showered upon Tatiana. At Gerasim, however, it was not every one who would dare to scoff. He did not like jokes. Indeed, in his presence, she too was left in peace. 
Whether she liked it or not, the girl found herself to be under his protection. Like all deaf mutes, he was very suspicious and readily perceived when they were laughing at him or at her. One day at dinner, the wardrobe keeper, Tatiana's superior, fell to nagging, as it is called, at her, and brought the poor thing to such a state that she did not know where to look and was almost crying with vexation. Gerasim got up all of a sudden, stretched out his gigantic hand, laid it on the wardrobe maid's head, and looked in her face with such a grim ferocity that her head positively flopped up on the table. Everyone was still. Gerasim took up his spoon again and went on with his cabbage soup. Look at him, the dumb devil, the wood demon, they all muttered in undertones, while the wardrobe maid got up and went out into the maid's room. Another time, noticing that Capitan, the same Capitan, who was the subject of the conversation reported above, was gossiping somewhat tentatively with Tatiana. Gerasim beckoned him to him, led him to the cart shed, and taking up a shaft that was standing in a corner by one end, lightly but most significantly menaced him with it. Since then, no one addressed a word to Tatiana. And all this cost him nothing. It is true, the wardrobe maid, as soon as she reached the maid's room, promptly fell into a fainting fit and behaved altogether so skillfully that Gerasim's rough action reached his mistress's knowledge the same day. But the capricious old lady only laughed, and several times, to the great offense of the wardrobe maid, forced her to repeat how he bent your head down with his heavy hand. And next day, she sent Gerasim a ruble. She looked on him with favor as a strong and faithful watchman. Gerasim stood in considerable awe of her. But all the same, he had hopes of her favor and was preparing to go to her with a petition for leave to marry Tatiana. He was only waiting for a new coat promised him by the steward to present a proper appearance before his mistress when the same mistress suddenly took it into her head to marry Tatiana to Capitan. The reader will now readily understand the perturbation of mind that took over the steward Gavrila after his conversation with his mistress. My lady, he thought, he, as he sat down at the window, favors Gerasim to be sure. Gavrila was well aware of this, and that was why he himself looked on him with an indulgent eye. Still, he is a speechless creature. I could not indeed put it before the mistress that Gerasim is courting Tatiana. But, after all, it's true enough, he is a queer sort of husband. On the other hand, that devil, God forgive me, has only got to find out they're marrying Tatiana to Capitan, he'll smash up everything in the house, upon my soul. There is no reasoning with him. Why he's such a devil? God forgive my sins. There's no getting him no how upon my soul. Capitan's entrance broke the thread of Gavrila's reflections. The dissipated shoemaker came in, his hand behind him and lounging care carelessly against a projecting angle of the wall near the door, crossed his right foot in front of his left and tossed his head as much as to say what do you want gavrila looked at capitan and dumped with his fingers and drummed with his fingers on the window frame capitan merely screwed up his leaden eyes a little but he did not look down he even grinned slightly and passed his hand over his whitish locks, which were sticking up in all directions. Well, here I am. What is it? You're a pretty fellow, said Gavrila, and paused. A pretty fellow you are. There's no denying. Capitan only twitched his little shoulders. Are you any better, pray? He thought to himself. Just look at yourself now. Look at yourself, Gavrila went on reproachfully. Now, whatever do you like? Whatever do you like? 
Capitan serenely surveyed his shabby, tattered coat and his patched trousers, and with special attention stared at his burst boots, especially the one on the tiptoe of which his right foot was so, was so gracefully poised, and he fixed his eyes again on the steward. Well, well, repeated Gavrila, well, and then you say well. You look like old Nick himself. For God forgive me saying so, that's what you look like. Capitan blinked rapidly. Go on am ambushing me, go on if you like, Gavrila Andreich, he thought to himself again. Here, you've been drunk again, Gavrila began. Drunk again, haven't you, eh? Come, answer me. Owing to the weakness of my health, I have exposed my, myself to spirituous beverages, certainly, replied Capitan. Owing to the weakness of your health, they let you off too easy, that's what it is, and you've been apprenticed in Petersburg. Much you learnt in your apprenticeship, you simply eat your bread in idleness. In that matter... Gavril Andrej, there is one to judge me, the Lord God himself, and no one else. He also knows what manner of man I be in this world, and whether I eat bread in idle, my bread in idleness. And as concerning your contention regarding drunkenness, in that matter too, I am not to blame, but rather a friend. He led me into temptation, but was diplomatic and got away while i while you were left like a goose in the street ah you're a dis dissolute fellow and that's not the point the steward went on i've something to tell you our lady here he paused a minute it's our lady's pleasure that you should be married do you hear she imagines you should be steadier when you're married do you understand to be sure I do. Well then, for my part, I think it would be better to give you a good hiding. But there, it's her business. Well, are you agreeable? Capitan grinned. Matrimony, matrimony is an excellent thing for anyone, Gavril Andrej. And as far as I am concerned, I shall be quite agreeable. Very well then replied Gavrila, while he reflected to himself. There is no denying the man expresses himself very properly. Only there's one thing, he pursued aloud. The wife Our Lady's picked out for you is an unlucky choice. Why, who is she, permit me to inquire? Tatiana. Tatiana? And Capitan opened his eyes and moved a little away from the wall. Well... What are you in such what are you in such a taking for? Isn't she to your taste, eh? Not to my taste, do you say, Gavril Andrej? She's right enough, a hard working, steady girl. But you know very well yourself, Gavril Andrej, why that fellow, that wild man of the wood, that monster of the steeps, he's after her, you know. I know, mate, I know all about it. The butler cut him short in a tone of annoyance, but there you see, but upon my soul, Gavril Andrej, why, he'll kill me, by God he will, he'll crush me like some fly, why, he's got a fist, why, you kindly look yourself, what a fist he's got, why, he's simply got a fist like Min Bajarsky, you see, he's deaf, he beats and does not hear how he's beating, he swings his great fists as if he sl he's asleep, and there's no possibility of pacifying him. And for why? Why? Because, as you know yourself, Gavril Andrej, he's deaf, and what's more, has no more wit than the heel of my foot. Why? He's a sort of beast, a heathen idol, Gavril Andrej, and worse, a block of wood. I, What I have done that I should have to suffer from him now, sure it is. It's all over me now. I've knocked about. I've had enough to put up with. I've been battered like an earthenware pot. But still, I am a man, after all, and not a worthless pot. 
I know, I know, don't go talking away. Lord my God, the shoemaker continued warmly. When is the end? When, O oh Lord, a poor wretch I am, a poor wretch whose sufferings are endless. What a life, what a life mine's been come to think of it. In my young days, I was beaten by a German. I was apprenticed to in the prime of life beaten to my own countrymen, and last of all, in ripe years, see what I have been brought to. Ah, you flabby soul, said Gavril Andreich, why do you make so many words about it? Why do you say, Gavril Andreich, it's not a beating I'm afraid of, Gavril Andreich, a gentleman may chastise me in private, but give me a civil word before folks, and I'm a man still. But see now whom I have to be with. Come, get along, Gavrila interposed impatiently. Capitan turned away and staggered off. But if it were not for him, the steward shouted after him, you would consent for your part? I signify my acquiescence, retorted Capitan as he disappeared. His fine language did not desert him even in the most trying positions. The steward walked several times up and down the room. Well, call Tatiana now, he said at last. A few instants later, Tatiana had come up most noiseless, almost noiselessly, and was standing in the doorway. What are your orders, Gavril Andreev? she said in a soft voice. The steward looked at her intently. Well, Tanyusha, he said, would you like to be married? Our lady has chosen a husband for you. Yes, Gavril Andreich. And whom has she deigned to name as husband for me? She added falteringly. Capitan the shoemaker. Yes, sir. He's a feather brained fellow, that's certain, but it's just for the mistress but it's just for that the mistress reckons upon you. Yes, sir. There's one difficulty. You know the deaf man, Gerasim, he's courting you, you see. How did you come to bewitch such a bear? But you see, he'll kill you, very like he's such a bear. He'll kill me, Gavrila Andrej, he'll kill me, and no mistake. Kill you? Well, we shall see about that. But do you mean... What do you mean by saying he'll kill you? Has he any right to kill you? Tell me yourself. I don't know, Gavril Andreich, about his having any right or not. What a woman. Why, you've made him no promise, I suppose. What are you pleased to ask of me? The steward was silent for a little, thinking. You're a meek soul. Well, that's right, he said aloud. Well, we'll have another talk with you later. Now go, Tanyusha. I see you're not unruly, certainly. Tatiana turned, steadied herself a little against the doorstep, and went away. And perhaps Our Lady will forget all about this wedding by tomorrow, thought the steward, and here I am worrying myself for nothing. As that, as for that, insolent fellow we must tie him down if it comes to that we must let the police know ustinya fyodorovna he shouted in a loud voice to his wife heed the samovar my good soul all that day tatiana hardly went out of the laundry at first she has she had started to at first she had started crying then she wiped away her tears and set to work as before Capitan stayed till late at night at the grin shop, at the gin shop with his friend, a man of gloomy appearance, to whom he related related in detail how he used to live in Petersburg with a gentleman, who would have been all right except he was a bit too strict, and he had a slight weakness besides. He was too fond of drink, and as to the fair sex, he didn't stick at anything. His gloomy companion merely said, yes, 
but when Capiton announced at last in a certain event, he would have to lay hands on himself tomorrow. His gloomy companion remarked that it was bed bedtime, and they parted in surly silence. Meanwhile, the steward's anticipations were not fulfilled. The old lady was so much taken up with the idea of Capiton's wedding that even in the night she talked of nothing else to one of her companions who was kept in her house solely to entertain her in case of sleeplessness and like a night cabman slept in the day when gavrila came to her after morning tea with his report her first question was and how about our wedding is it all getting is it getting on all right he he replied of course that it was he replied of course that it was getting on first rate and that capitan would appear before her to pay his reverence to her that day the old lady was not quite well she did not give much time to business the steward went back to his own room and called a council the matter certainly called for serious consideration Tatiana would make no difficulty, of course, but Capitan had declared in the hearing of all that he had but one head to lose, not two or three. Gerasim turned rapid, sullen looks on everyone, would not budge from the steps of the maid's quarters, and seemed to guess that some mischief was about was being hatched against him. They met together. Among them was an old sideboard waiter, nicknamed Uncle Tail, to whom everyone looked respectfully for counsel, though all they got out of him was, Here's a pretty pass, to be sure, to be sure, to be sure, as a preliminary measure of security to provide against contingencies, they locked Capitan up in the lumber room where the filter was kept then considered the question with the gravest deliberation it would to be sure be easy to have recourse to force but heaven save us there would be an uproar the mistress would be put out it would be awful what should they do they thought and thought and at last thought out a solution it had a many a time been observed that gerasim could not bear drunkards as he sat at the gates, he would always turn away with disgust when someone passed by intoxicated with unsteady steps and his cap on one side of his ear. They resolved that Tatiana should be instructed to pretend to be tipsy and should pass Gerasim staggering and reeling about. The poor girl refused for a long, for a long while to agree to this but they persuaded her at last she saw too that it was the only possible way of getting rid of her adorer she went out capitan was released from the lumber room for after all he had an interest in the affair gerasim was sitting on the curbstone of the gates scraping the ground with a spade from behind every corner from behind every window blind the others were watching him The trick succeeded beyond all expectations. On seeing Tatiana, at first he nodded as usual, making caressing, inarticulate sounds. Then he looked carefully at her, dropped his spade, jumped up, went up to her, brought his face close to her face. In her fright she staggered more than ever and shut her eyes. He took her by the arm, whirled her right across the yard, and going to the room where the council had been sitting, pushed her straight at Capitan. Tatiana fairly swooned away. Gerasim stood, looked at her, waved his hand, laughed, and went off, stepping heavily to his garret. For the next twenty-four hours he did not come out of it. The position Antipka said afterwards that he saw Gerasim through a crack in the wall, sitting on his bedstead, his face in his hand. From time to time he uttered soft, regular sounds. He was wailing a dirge. 
that is swaying backwards and forwards with his eyes shut and shaking his head as drivers or barge men do when they chant their melancholy songs. Antipka could not bear it, and he came away from the crack. When Gerasim came out of the garret the next day, no particular change could be observed in him. He only seemed, as it were, more morose, and took not the slightest notice of Tatiana or Capitan. The same evening, they both had to appear before their mistress with geese under their arms, and in a week's time they were married. Even on the day of the wedding, Gerasim showed no change of any sort in his behavior. Only he came back from the river without water, and he had somehow broken the barrel on the road, and at night in the stable he washed and rubbed his horse so vigorously that it swayed like a blade of grass in the wind, and staggered from one leg to the other under his fists of iron. All this had taken place in the spring. Another year passed by, during which Capitan became a hopeless drunkard, and as being absolutely of no use for anything, he was sent away with the store wagons to a distant village with his wife. On the day of his departure, he put a very good face on at first, and declared that he would always be at home, send him where they would, even to the other end of the world. But later on he lost heart, began grumbling that he was being taken to uneducated people, and collapsed so completely at last that he could not even put his own hat on. Some charitable soul stuck it on his forehead set the peak straight in front, and thrust it with a slap from above. When everyone was quite ready, the peasants already held the reins in their hands and were only waiting for the words, with God's blessing. To start, Gerasim came out of his garret, went up to Tatiana, and gave her as a parting present a red cotton handkerchief he had brought for her a year ago. Tatiana, who had to that instant borne all the revolting details of her life with great indifference could not control herself upon that. She burst into tears, and as she took her seat in the cart, she kissed Gerasim three times like a good Christian. He meant to accompany her as far as the town barrier, and did walk beside her cart for a while, but he stopped suddenly at the Crimean ford, waved his hand, and walked away along the riverside. It was getting towards evening. He walked slowly, watching the water. All of a sudden, he fancied something was floundering in the mud close to the bank. He stooped over and saw a little white and black puppy, who, in spite of all his efforts, could not get out of the water. It was struggling, slipping back and trembling all over its thin little wet little body. Gerasim took, Gerasim looked at the unlucky little dog, picked it up with one hand, put it in the bosom of his coat, and hurried with long steps homewards. He went into his garret, put the rescued puppy on his bed, covered it with his thick overcoat, ran first to the stable for straw, and then to the kitchen for a cup of milk. Carefully folding back the overcoat and spreading out the straw, he set the milk on the bedstead. The poor little puppy was not more than three weeks old. Its eyes were just open. One eye still seemed rather larger than the other. It did not know how to lap out of a cup, and did nothing but shiver and blink. Gerasim took hold of its head softly with two fingers and dipped its little nose into the milk. The puppy suddenly began lapping greedily, sniffing and shaking itself and choking. Gerasim watched and watched it, and all at once he laughed outright. All night he was waiting on it, keeping it covered and rubbing it dry. He fell asleep himself at last, and slept quietly and happily by its side. No mother could have looked after their baby as Gerasim looked after his little nursling. At first she, for the pup turned out to be a bitch, was very weak, feeble, and ugly. 
but by degrees she grew stronger and improved in looks and thanks to the unflagging care of her preserver in eight months time she was transformed into a very pretty dog of the spaniel breed with long ears and bushy spiral tail and large impressive eyes she was devotedly attached to gerasim and was never a yard from his side she always followed him about wagging her tail he had even given her a name the dumb know that their inarticulate noises call the attention of others he called her mumu all the servants in the house liked her and called her mumu too she was very intelligent she was friendly with everyone but was only fond of gerasim gerasim on his side loved her passionately and he didn't like it when other people stroked her whether he was afraid of her or jealous god knows she used to wake him up in the morning pulling at his coat she used to take the reins in her mouth and bring him up the old horse that carried the water with whom she was on very friendly terms with a face of great importance she used to go with him to the river she used to watch his brooms and spades and never allowed anyone to go into his garret he cut a little hole in his door on purpose for her and she seemed to feel that only in gerasim's garret she was completely mistress and at home and directly she went in she used to jump with a satisfied air upon the bed at night she did not sleep at all but she never barked without sufficient cause like some stupid house dog who sitting on its hind legs blinking with its nose in the air barks simply from dullness at the stars usually three times in succession no mumu's delicate little voice was never raised without good reason either some stranger was passing close to the fence or there was some suspicious sound or rustle somewhere in fact she was an excellent watchdog it is true that there was another dog in the yard a tawny old dog with brown spots called wolf but he was never even at night let off the chain and indeed he was so discrepant that he did not wish even wish for freedom he used to lie curled up in his kennel and only rarely uttered a sleepy almost noiselessly bark which broke off at once as though he were himself aware of its uselessness mumu never went into the mistress's house and when gerasim carried wood into the rooms she always stayed behind impatiently waiting for him at the steps pricking up her ears and turning her head to right and to left at the slightest creak of the door so passed another year gerasim went on performing his duties as house porter and was very well content with his lot when suddenly an unexpected incident occurred on fine summer day one fine summer day the old lady was walking up and down the drawing room with her dependents she was in high spirits she laughed and made jokes her servile companions laughed and joked too but they did not feel particularly mirthful the household did not much like it when their mistress was in a lively mood for to begin with she expected from everyone prompt and complete participation in her merriment and was furious if anyone showed a face that did not beam with delight and secondly these outbursts never lasted long with her and were usually followed by a sour gloomy mood that day she had got up in a lucky hour at cards she took the four knaves which means fulfillment of one's wishes she used to try her fortune on the cards every morning and her tea struck her as particularly delicious for which her maid was rewarded by words of praise and by two pence in money with a sweet smile on her wrinkled lips the lady walked about the, the drawing-room and went up to the window 
a flower garden had been laid out before the window and in the very middle and in the very middle bed under a rose bush lay mumu busily gnawing a bone the lady caught sight of her mercy on us she cried suddenly what dog is that the companion addressed by the old lady hesitated poor thing in that wretched state of uneasiness which is common in any person in a dependent position who doesn't know very well what significance to give to the explanation of a superior i i don't don't know she flattered i fancy yes yeah, she faltered i fancy it's the dumb man's dog mercy the lady cut her short but it's a charming little dog order it be brought in has he had it long how is it that i've never seen it before order it to be brought in the companion flew at once into the hall boy boy she shouted bring mumu in at once she's in the flower garden her name's mumu then observed the lady a very nice name oh very indeed chimed in the companion make haste upon Stepan, a sturdily built young fellow whose duties were those of a footman, rushed headlong into the flower garden and tried to capture Mumu. But she cleverly slipped from his fingers and with her tail in the air fled full speed to Gerasen, who was at the instant in the kitchen, knocking out and cleaning a barrel turning it upside down in his hand like a child's drum. Stepan ran after her and tried to catch her at her, mistre at her master's feet. But the sensible dog would not let a stranger touch her, and with a bound she got away. Gerasim looked on with a smile at all, his, at all this ado. At last Stepan got up, much amazed, and hardly explained to him by signs that the mistress wanted the dog brought in to her. Gerasim was a little astonished. He called Mumu, however, picked her up and handed her over to Stepan. Stepan carried her into the drawing room and put her down on the par parquet floor. The old lady began calling the dog to her in a coaxing voice. Mumu, who had never in her life been in such magnificent apartments, was very much frightened and made a rush for the door, but being driven back by the obsequious Stepan, she began trembling and huddled close up against the wall. Mumu, Mumu, come to me, come to your mistress, she said the lady. Come, silly thing, don't be afraid. Come, Mumu, to the mistress, come, come to the mistress, repeated the companions, come along. But Mumu looked around her uneasily and did not stir. Bring her something to eat, said the old lady. How stupid is she? She won't come to her mistress. What's she afraid of? She's not used to your honor yet, ventured one of the companions in a timid and conciliatory voice. Stepan brought in a saucer of milk and set it before Mumu. But Mumu would not even sniff at the milk and still shivered and looked round as before ah what a silly thing you are said the lady and going up to her she stooped down and was about to stroke her but mumu turned her head abruptly and showed her teeth the lady hurried the lady hurriedly drew back her hand a momentary silence followed mumu gave a faint whine as though she would complain and apologize. The old lady moved back, scowling. The dog's sudden move movement had frightened her. Ah! shrieked all the companions at once. She's not bitten you, has she? Heaven forbid. Mumu had never bitten anyone in her life. Ah! Ah! Take her away, said the old lady in a charged voice. Wretched little dog, what a spiteful creature. And turning round deliberately she went towards her boudoir her companions looked timidly at one another and were about to follow her but she stopped stared coldly at them and said what's that for pray i've not called you and went out
The companions waved their hands to Stepan in despair. He picked up Mumu and flung her promptly outside the door, just at Gerasim's feet, and half an hour later a profound stillness led in the house, and the old lady sat on her sofa, looking blacker than a thundercloud. What trifles, if you think of it, will sometimes disturb anyone? Till evening, the lady was out of humor. She did not talk to anyone, did not play cards, and passed a bad night. She fancied the eau de cologne they gave her was not the same as she usually had, and that her pillow smelt of soap, and she made the wardrobe maid smell all the bed linen. In fact, she was very upset and cross altogether. Next morning, she ordered Gavrila to be summoned an hour earlier than usual. Tell me, please, she began directly the latter, not without some inward trepidation, crossed the threshold of her boudoir. What dog was that barking all night in our yard? It wouldn't let me sleep. A dog? Hmm. What dog? Hmm. Maybe the dumb man's dog? Hmm. He brought out in a rather unsteady voice. I don't know whether it was the dumb man's or whose, but it wouldn't let me sleep. I wonder what we have such a lot of dogs for. I wish to know. We have a yard dog, haven't we? Oh, yes. Hmm. We have hmm. wolf. Hmm. Well, why more? What do we want more dogs for? It's simply introducing disorder. There's no one in control in the house, that's what it is. And what does the dumb man want with a dog? Who gave him leave to keep dogs in my yard? Yesterday I went to the window and there was there it was lying in the flower garden, and it dragged in nastiness, it was gno it was gnawing, and my roses are planted there. The lady ceased. Let her be gone from today, do you hear? Yes, mm. Today, now go, I will send for you later for the report. Gavrila went away. As he went through the drawing room, the steward, by way of maintaining order, moved a bell from one table to another. He steadily blew his duck-like nose in the hall and went into the outer hall. In the outer hall, on a locker was Stepan asleep in the attitude of a slain warrior in a battalion picture, his bare legs thrust out below the coat which served him for a blanket. The steward gave him a shove and whispered some instructions to him, to which Stepan responded with somewhat between a yawn and a laugh. The steward went out, and Stepan got up, put on his coat and his boots, went out and stood on the steps. Five minutes had not passed before Gerasim made his appearance with a huge bundle of hewn logs on his back, accompanied by the inseparable Mumu. The lady had given orders that her bedroom and boudoir should be heated at all times, even in summer. Gerasim turned sideways before the door, shoved it open with his shoulder, and staggered into the house with his load. Mumu, as usual, stayed behind to wait for him. Then Stepan seized his chance, suddenly pounced on her like a kite on a chicken, held her down to the ground, gathered her up in his arms, and without even putting his cap, ran out of the yard with her, got into the first fly he met, and galloped off to the marketplace. There he soon found a purchaser, to whom he sold her for a shilling, on condition that he would keep her for at least a week tied up. Then he returned at once, but before he got home, he got off the fly, and going right round the yard, jumped over the fence into the yard from a back street. He was afraid to go in the gate for fear of meeting Gerasim. His anxiety was unnecessary, however, Gerasim was no longer in the yard. On coming out of the house, he had at once missed Mumu. He never remembered her failing to wait for his return, and he began running up and down looking for her and calling her in his own way. He rushed up to his garret, up to the hayloft, 
ran out into the streets, this way and that. She was lost. He turned to the other serfs with the most despairing signs, questioned them about her, pointing to her height from the ground, describing her with his hands. Some of them really did not know what had become of Mumu, but merely shook their heads. Others did know and smiled to him for all response, while the steward assumed an important air and began scolding the coachman. Then Gerasim ran right away out of the yard. It was dark by the time he came back. From his worn-out look, his unsteady walk, and his dusty clothes, it might be surmised that he had been running all over half Moscow. He stood still opposite the windows of the mistress's house, took a searching look at the steps where a group of house serfs were crowded together, turned away and uttered once more his inarticulate Mumu. Mumu did not answer. He went away. Everyone looked after him, but no one smiled or said a word, and the inquisitive position and the inquisitive postilion Antipka reported next morning in the kitchen that the dumb man had been groaning all night. All the next day, Gerasim did not show himself, so that they were obliged to send the coachman Patab for water instead of him, at which the coachman Patab was anything but pleased. The lady asked Gavrila if her orders had been carried out. Gavrila replied that they had. The next morning, Gerasim came out of his garret and went about his work. He came to his dinner ate it and went out again without greeting without a greeting to any one his face which had always been lifeless as well as as with all deaf mutes seemed now to be turned to stone after dinner he went out of the yard again but not for long he came back and went straight up to the hayloft night came on a clear moonlight night Gerasim lay breathing heavily and incessantly turning from side to side. Suddenly, he felt something pull at the skirt of his coat. He started, but did not raise his head and even shut his eyes tighter. But again there was a pull, stronger than before. He jumped up before him, and with an end of string around her neck was Mumu, twisting and turning. A prolonged cry of delight broke from his speechless breast. He caught up Mumu and hugged her tight in his arms. She licked his nose and eyes and beard and mustache all in one instant. He stood a little, thought a minute, crept cautiously down from the hayloft, looked around and having satisfied himself that no one could see him, made his way successfully to his garret. Gerasim had guessed before that his dog had not got lost by her own doing, but she must have been taken away by the mistress's orders. The servants had explained to him by signs that his mumu had snapped at her, and he determined to take his own measures. He First, he fed mumu with a bit of bread, fondled her, and put her to bed. Then he fell to meditating and spend the whole night long in meditating how he could best conceal her. At last he decided to leave her all day in the garret and only come in now and then to see her and to take her out at night. The hole in the door he stopped up effectually with his old overcoat and almost before it was light he was already in the yard and though nothing had happened even innocent guile, the same expression of melancholy on his face. It did not occur to the poor deaf man that Mumu would betray herself by her whining. In reality, everyone in the house was soon aware that the dumb man's dog had come back and was locked up in his garret, but from sympathy with him and with her, and partly perhaps from dread of him, they did not let him know that they had found out his secret. The steward scratched his head and gave a despairing wave of his head, as much as to say, 
Well, well, God have mercy on him, if only it doesn't come to the mistress's ears. But the dumb man had never shown such energy as on that day. He cleaned and scraped the whole courtyard, pulled up every single weed with his own hand, tugged up every stake in the fence of the flower garden to satisfy herself that they were strong enough, and unaided drove them in again. In fact, he toiled and labored so that even the old lady noticed his zeal. Twice in the course of the day, Gerasim went stealthily in to see his prisoner. When night came on, he lay down to sleep with her in the garret, not in the hay loft. And only at two o'clock in the night, he went out to take her a turn in the fresh air. After walking about the courtyard a good while with her, he was just turning back when suddenly a rustle was heard behind the fence on the side of the back street. Mumu pricked up her ears, growled, went up to the fence, sniffed, and gave vent to a loud, shrill bark. Some drunkard had thought fit to take refuge under the fence for the night. At that very time, the old lady had just fallen asleep after a prolonged fit of nervous agitation. These fits of agitation always overtook her after too hearty a supper. The sudden bark waked her up. Her heart palpitated, and she felt faint. "'Girls, girls!' she moaned. "'Girls!' the terrified maids ran into her bedroom. "'Oh, oh, I am dying,' she said, flinging her arms about in her agitation. "'Again, that dog! Again! Oh, send for the doctor! They mean to be the death of me! The dog! The dog again! Oh!' And she let her head fall back, as always signified a swoon. Which always signified a swoon. They rushed for the doctor, that is, for the household physician, Hariton. This doctor, whose whole qualification cons consisted in wearing soft-soled boots, knew how to feel the pulse delicately. He used to sleep 14 hours out of the 24, but the rest of the time he was always sighing and continually dozing the old lady with cherry bay drops. This doctor ran up at once, fumigated the room with burnt feathers, and when the old lady opened her eyes, promptly offered her a wine glass of the hollow drops on a silver tray. The old lady took them, but began again at once in a tearful voice complaining of the dog, of Gavrila and of her fate, declaring that she was a poor old woman and that everyone had forsaken her, no one pitied her. Everyone wished her dead. Meanwhile, the luckless Mumu had gone on barking, while Gerasim tried in vain to call her away from the fence. There, there, again, groaned the old lady, and once more she turned up the whites of her eyes. The doctor whispered to a maid. She rushed into the outer hall and shook Stif Stepan. He ran to wake Gavrila. Gavrila, in a fury, ordered the whole household to get up. Gerasim turned around, saw lights and shadows moving in the windows, and with an instinct of coming trouble in his heart put Mumu under his arm, ran into his garret and locked himself in. A few minutes later, five men were banging at, at his door, but feeling the resistance of the bolt, they stopped. Gavrila ran up in a fearful state of mind and ordered them all to wait there and watch till morning. Then he flew off himself to the maid's quarter, and through an old companion, Lubov Lubimovna, with whose assistance he used to steal tea, sugar, and other groceries, and to falsify the accounts, sent word to the mistress that the dog had unhappily run back from somewhere, but that tomorrow she would be killed, and would the mistress be so gracious as to not be angry and to overlook it? The old lady would probably have not been so soon appeased, but the doctor had in haste given her fully forty drops instead of twelve. The strong dose of narcotic acted. In a quarter of an hour the old lady was in a sound and peaceful sleep, while Gerasim was lying with a white face on his bed, holding Mumu's mouth tightly shut. 
Next morning, the lady woke up rather late. Gavrila was waiting till she should be awake to give the order to for a final assault on Gerasim's stronghold while he prepared himself to face a fearful storm. But the storm did not come. The old lady lay in bed and sent for the eldest of her dependent companions. Lyubov Lyubimovna, she began in a subdued weak, weak voice. She was fond of playing the part of an oppressed and forsaken victim. Needless to say, everyone in the household was made extremely uncomfortable at such times. Lyubov Lyubimovna, you see my position. Go, my love, to Gavrila Andreevich and talk to him a little. Can he really prize some wretched cur above the repose, the very life of his mistress? I could not bear to think so, she added, with an expression of deep feeling. Go, my love. Be so good as to go to Gavrila Andreevich for me. Lyubov Lyubimovna went to Gavrila's room. What conversation passed between them is not known, but a short time after, a whole crowd of people was moving across the yard in the direction of Gerasim's garret. Gavrila walked in front, holding his cap on with his hand, though there was no wind. The footmen and cooks were close behind him. Uncle Tail was looking out if a widow giving instructions, that is to say, simply waving his hands. At the rear, there was a crowd of small boys skipping and hopping along. Half of them were outsiders who ran up. On the narrow staircase leading to the garret sat one guard. At the door were standing two more with sticks. They began to, to mount the stairs, which they entirely blocked up. Gavrila went up to the door, knocked with his fist, shouting, Open the door! A stifled bark was audible, but there was no answer. Open the door, I tell you, he repeated. But Gavril Andreevich, Stepan observed from below, he's deaf, you know he doesn't hear. They all laughed. What do we do? Gavrila rejoined from above. Why, there's a hole there in the door, answered Stepan. So you shake the stick in there. Gavrila bent down. He stuffed it up with a coat or something. Well, you just push the coat in. At this moment, a smothering bark was heard again. See, see, she speaks for herself, was remarked in the crowd, and again they laughed. Gavrila scratched his ear. No, mate, he responded at last. You can poke the coat in yourself if you like. All right, let me. And Stepan scrambled up, took the stick, pushed the coat, and began waving the stick in the opening, saying, come out, come out, as he did so. He was still waving the stick when suddenly the door of the garret was flung open. All the crowd flew pell-mell down the stairs instantly. Gavrila first of all. Uncle Tail locked the window. Come, 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 shouted Gavrila from the yard. Mind what you're about. Gerasim stood without stirring in, in his doorway. The crowd gathered at the foot of the stairs. Gerasim, with his arms akimbo, looked down at these poor creatures in German coats, and in his red peasant's shirt, he looked like a giant before them. Gavrila took a step forward. Mind, mate, he said, don't be insolent. And he began to explain to him by signs that the mistress insists on having his dog, that he must hand it over at once, or it would be worse for him. Gerasim looked at him, pointed to the dog, made a notion with his hand around his neck, and though he were pulling a noose tight, and glanced with a face of inquiry at the steward. Yes, yes, the letter ascended, nodding. Yes, just so. Gerasim dropped his eyes, then all of a sudden roused himself and pointed to Mumu, who was all the while standing beside him, innocently innocently wagging her tail and pricking up her ears inquisitively. Then he repeated the strangling action around his neck and significantly struck himself on the breast, as though announcing he would take upon himself the task of killing Mumu. But you'll deceive us, Gerasim waved back in response. Gerasim looked at him, smiled scornfully, struck himself again on the breast, and slammed the door. 
They all looked at one another in silence. What does that mean? Gavrila began. He's locked himself in. Let him be, Gavrila Andreevich, Stepan advised. He'll do as he'll do it if he promised. He's like that, you know. If he makes a promise, it's a certain thing. He's not like others in that. The truth's the truth with him. Yes, indeed. Yes, they all repeated, nodding their heads. Yes, that's so. Yes. Uncle Tail opened his window, and he too said, Yes. Well, maybe. We shall see, responded Gavrila. Anyway, we won't take off the guard. Here you, Eroshka, he added, addressing a poor fellow in the yellow nankeen coat who considered himself to be a gardener. What have you to do? Take a stick and sit here, and if anything happens, run to me at once. Yeroshka took a stick and sat down on the bottom stair. The crowd dispersed, all except a few inquisitive small boys, while Gavrila went home and sent word through Lubov Lubilmovna to the mistress that everything had been done, while he sent a position for a policeman in case of need. The old lady tied a knot in her handkerchief, sprinkled some eau de cologne on it, sniffed it, sniffed at it and rubbed her temples with it, drank some tea, and, being still under the influence of the cherry bay drops, fell asleep again. An hour after all this hubbub, the garret door opened, and Gerasim showed himself. He had on his best coat. He was leading Mumu by a string. Yeroshka moved aside and let him pass. Gerasim went to the gates. All the small boys in the yard stared at him in silence. He did not even turn around. He only put on his cap in the street. Gavrila sent the same Yeroshka to follow him and keep watch on him as a spy. Yeroshka, seeing from a distance that he had gone into a cook shop with his dog, waited for him to come out again. Gerasim was well known at the cook shop, and his signs were understood. He asked for cabbage soup with meat in it, and sat down with his arms on the table. Mumu stood beside his chair, looking calmly at him with her intelligent eyes. Her coat was glossy. One could see that she had just been calmed down. They brought Gerasim the soup. He crumbled some bread into it, cut the meat up small, and put the plate on the ground. Mumu began eating in her usual refined way, with her muzzle daintily held so as scarcely to touch her food. Gerasim gazed a long while at her. Two big ears suddenly rolled Two big tears suddenly rolled from his eyes. One fell on the dog's brow, the other into the soup. He shaded his face with his hand. Mumu ate up half the plateful and came away from it, licking her lips. Gerasim got up, paid for the soup, and went out, followed by the rather perplexed glances of the waiter. Yeroshka Seeing Gerasim hid round a corner and letting him get in front, followed him again. Gerasim walked without haste, still holding Mumu by a string. When he got to the corner of the street, he stood still as though reflecting and suddenly set off with rapid steps to the Crimean ford. On the way, he went into the yard of a house. On the way, he went into the yard of a house where a lodge was being built, and carried away two bricks under his arm. At the Crimean ford, he turned along the bank, went to a place where there were two little rowing boats fastened to stakes, he had noticed them there before, and jumped into one of them with Mumu. A lame old man came out of a shed in the corner of a kitchen garden and shouted after him, but Gerasim only nodded and began rowing so vigorously though against the stream that an instant that in an instant he had darted two hundred yards away the old man stood for a while scratched his back first with the left and then with the right hand and went back hobbling to his sh to the shed gerasim rode on and on moscow was soon left behind Meadows stretched each, each side of the bank, market gardens, fields, and copses. Peasants' huts began to make their appearance. 
there was a fragrance of the country. He drew, he threw down his oars, bent his head down to Mumu, who was sitting facing him on a dry cross seat. The bottom of the boat was full of water and stayed motionless. His mighty hands clasped upon her back while the boat was gradually carried back by the current towards the town. At last, Gerasim drew himself up hurriedly. With a sort of sick anger in his face, he tied up he tied up the bricks he had taken with a string, made a running noose, put it around Mumu's neck, lifted her up over the river, and for the last time looked at her. She watched him confidingly and without fear, faintly wagging her tail. He turned away, frowned, and wrung his hands. Gerasim heard nothing. Neither the quick, shrill whine of Mumu as she fell, nor the heavy splash of the water. For him, the noisiest day was soundless and silent, as even the stillness night, as even the stillest night, is not silent to us. When he opened his eyes again, little wavelets were hurrying over the river chasing one another as before they broke against the boat's side. And only far away behind circles moving, widening to the bank. Directly Gerasim had vanished from Yeroshka's sight, the latter returned home and reported what he had seen. Well then, observed Stepan, he'll drown her. Now we can feel easy about it if he once promises a thing. No one saw Gerasim during the day. He did not have dinner at home. Evening came on. They were all gathered together to supper, except him. What a strange creature that Gerasim is, piped a fat laundry maid. Fancy upsetting himself like that over a dog, upon my word. But Gerasim has been here, Stepan cried all at once, scraping up his porridge with a spoon. How? When? Why, a couple of hours ago. Yes, indeed, I ran against him at the gate. He was going out from here. He was going out again from here, and he was coming out of the yard. I tried to ask him about his dog, but he wasn't in the best of humors, I could see. Well, he gave me a shove. I suppose he only meant to me out of his way, if he'd say, let me go, do. But he fetched me such a crack on my neck, so seriously, that, oh, oh, and Stepan who could not help laughing, shrugged up and rubbed the back of his head. Yes, he added, he has got a fist. It's something like a fist. There's no denying that. They all laughed at Stepan, and after supper they separated to go to bed. Meanwhile, at that very time, a gigantic figure with a bag on his shoulders and a stick in his hand was eagerly and persistently stepping out along the tea high road. It was Gerasim. He was hurrying on without looking round, hurrying homewards to his own village, to his own country. After drowning poor Mumu, he had run back to his garret, hurried, hurriedly packed a few things together in an old horse cloth, tied it up in a bundle, tossed it on his shoulder, and so was ready. He had noticed the road carefully, when he was brought to Moscow. The village his mistress had taken him from lay only about twenty miles off the high road. He walked along it with a sort of invincible purpose, a desperate and at the same time joyous determination. He walked, his shoulders thrown back and his chest expanded. His eyes were fixed greedily straight before him. He hastened as though his old mother were fainting for him at once, as though she were calling him to her after long wanderings in strange parts, among strangers. The summer night that was just dr drawing in was still and warm. On one side, where the sun had set, the horizon was still light and faintly flushed in, the last glow of the vanished day. On the other side, a blue-gray twilight had, had already risen. The night was coming up from that quarter. Quails were in hundreds round. 
corncrakes were calling to one another in the thickets. Gerasim could not hear them. He could not hear the delicate night whispering of the trees by which his strong legs carried him. But he smelt the familiar scent of the ripening rye, which was wafted from the dark fields. He felt the wind flying to meet him, the wind from home beat caressingly upon his face and play with his hair and his beard. He saw before him the whiten whitening road homewards, straight as an arrow. He saw the sky stars innumerable lighting up his way and stepped out, strong and bold as a lion, so that when the rising sun shed its moist, rosy light upon the still fresh and unwearying and unwearied traveler, already thirty miles lay between him and Moscow. In a couple of days he was at home in his little hut, to the great astonishment of the soldier's wife, who had been up in there. After praying before the holy pictures, he set off at once to the village elder. The village elder was at first surprised, but the hay-cutting had just begun. Gerasim was a first-rate mower, and they put a scythe into his hand on the spot, and he went to mow in his old way, mowing so that the peasants were fairly astounded as they watched his wide, sweeping strokes and the heaps he raked together. In Moscow, the day after Gerasim's flight, they missed him. They went to his garret, rummaged about in it, and spoke to Gavrila. He came, looked, shrugged his shoulders and decided that, that the dumb man had either run away or had drowned himself with his stupid dog they gave information to the police and informed the lady the old lady was furious burst into tears gave orders that he was to be found whatever happened declared she had never ordered the dog to be destroyed and in fact gave gavrila such a rating that he could not do nothing all day but shake his head and murmur well until uncle tail checked him at last sympathetically echoing well at last the news came from the country of gerasim's being there the old lady was some was somewhat pacified at first she issued a mandate for him to be brought back without delay to moscow afterwards however she declared that such an ungrateful creature was absolutely of no use to her soon after she died herself and her ears had no thought to spare for gerasim they let their mothers others other servants redeem their freedom on payment of an annual rent and gerasim is still living a lonely man in his lonely hut he is strong and healthy as before, and does the work of four men as before, and as before is serious and steady. But his neighbors have observed that ever since he returned from Moscow, he was quite given up the society. He has quite given up the society of women. He will not even look at them, and does not keep even a single dog. It's his good luck, though, the peasants reason, that he can get on without female folk and as for a dog what need has he of a dog you wouldn't get a thief to go into his yard for any money such is the fame of the dumb man's titanic strength